Although America leads the way, taking ownership of 67% of the world's serial killers, Asia is a close second. With Japan and India leading the way with some of the world's most creative serial killers. But there are many experts who believe that we're selling Asia short. Widespread police corruption, salaries that are based on performance, meaning if unaccounted bodies start turning up, they don't get paid. Large rural areas, adverse poverty and overpopulation. Hell, a country like India probably welcomes a serial killer to come along once in a while and lighten their load. In some of these places, life is cheaper than one of those hookers with no legs riding around on skateboards in Bangladesh. You know the score. So we may never know the true number of serial killers in the Far East. Early 1980s Hong Kong, a crowded island with a population topping 5 million and growing steadily. Although an annual 21,000 were leaving permanently each year in preparation for the Chinese takeover. Still under British rule, by 1980, it had become an economical powerhouse. Has one of the safest cities in Asia, and also the best police force. And as in 1982, there'd never been a documented case of a serial killer. But there's no such thing as a sure thing. And I guess the only sure thing there is, is that there's no such thing as a sure thing. Welcome to Hong Kong's nightclub district, where every day of the week is the weekend. Row after row of joints where you can get your cock sucked. A regular Sodom and Gomorrah. A cesspool, if you will. But like all cesspools, this shit rises to the top. 21-year-old Chun Fun Len worked at one of those clubs. And she stayed late to have drinks with some of her friends. But having a drink or two, or three too many, she left a little worse for wear. It was about 2.30 a.m. that her friends helped her outside into a cab. Saying goodbye to their drunken friend, promising to meet up the next night. Little did they know, her death clock was now ticking. It was a week later that a construction worker would find the plastic bag floating in the river. When he opened it, there was a woman's head in it. And over the next three weeks, cops would find more plastic bags containing body parts, including the torso that had had its sexual organ cut out. I mean, what sort of man cuts out a pussy? You don't have to answer that. That was a rhetorical question. The only way to identify the body parts, except for the limbs that by chance were all wearing the same nail varnish, was a tattoo on the arm, a two swallows and a heart. And they gave that information to the papers, hoping they'd shake something out of the trees. And I guess if it weren't a mess, they would do it until one got there. Once the story hit the papers, acquaintances came forward and said they knew who the arm belonged to, and probably the rest of the body parts. It was a nightclub hostess slash prostitute. She'd had too much to drink, and they helped her out into a cab. And they said they couldn't tell what the driver looked like for sure, except they were a Chinaman. Huh. I guess they can't even tell each other apart. Meaning that Homicide had that job set up for them. Because there were almost as many cabs in Hong Kong as Chinamen, and all of those cabs were driven by Chinamen. But the friends also said that the hostess had been married and had two kids, and that her husband wasn't too fond of her sucking cock for a living. But when they checked out the husband, he had an alibi that was tighter than the Velcro strap on a spastic spoon. So at the end of the day, the only lead the cops had was a cab driver who looked like a Chinaman which I'm guessing wasn't worth calling out the squad cars for. When the noodle-eating cops 
got to poking around in their missing person reports, they'd discovered only a couple of weeks earlier that a 17-year-old student had gone missing. She'd gone out to her graduation celebration at a swanky hotel, and she never returned. Her parents said that she'd usually take the train back, but that night they gave her some money for a cab. And that she was a good girl, and she had no cause to run away. Which caused the cops great consternation, because they may have a serial killer loose on their streets. But that's the thing about being a cop in a country that has almost zero crime. When one finally comes along, you don't have much practice to have become good at it. Now Hong Kong homicide was starting to find the pieces, and all I had to do was put those pieces together. Chan Won Kim was a 31-year-old cashier out having drinks with friends after work. She'd last been seen by those friends hailing a cab. It was after that that she disappeared like a ghost. A Chinese ghost. And because these were standard fares, Homicide had no way of tracing who the driver was. Lung Se Wan was much like the other girls. She got into a cab. She never got out again. Abracadabra. Well, at least not on her own two legs. Now investigators knew one thing for certain, that whoever was doing it had hunger. And when you got a hunger, eventually, you gotta feed. Hong Kong's finest now believed that they had a serial killer on their streets. But still, they had no way to prove it. And yeah, sure, they had parts of a whore who'd washed up on shore. And she was missing a pussy. But as far as physical evidence went, that's where it began and where it ended. The other three girls, well, they were just a hunch. For all the cops knew, they could have all decided to go to Disneyland and liked it so much that they stayed. The only thing that tied it all together were all four of the women who were last seen climbing into a cab. And I guess if it weren't a mess, well, it'd do until one got there. So they kept dragging the river, the bay, or any other puddles they could find looking for body parts. But it was six months later, when the case was at risk of going cold. The noodle-eating cops got a call from a photo processing joint, who just developed some pictures that they figured that the cops, well, they might be interested in. The photos appeared to show young girls that were being cut up, and sometimes while they were still alive. And by the looks of it, they weren't consenting. When investigators staked out the photo joint, they were told by the technician to expect the cab driver in his early 30s to pick up the pitches. And sure enough, he arrived, and about 20 detectives undercover swooped in and arrested him. Of course, he denied it and said he was picking him up for a friend. But no one's that good of a friend, and they knew they had that Chinaman. And that Chinaman was 27-year-old Lam Kao Wan. When they checked his cab, they found some handcuffs and a knife. And while they took him in for questioning, they sent their amigos over to check out where he lived. But the first thing they notice is that if the cab driver did it, he had balls big enough for a fruit basket, because he was as cool as a cucumber. When they got to his apartment, they found out he lived with his father, mother, and younger brother. When they started tearing apart the room he shared with his brother, they found Tupperware jars hidden that appeared to contain preserved meat, along with a trunk full of surgical journals, photographs, and videotapes, along with precision cutting tools. It was then that they realized that the jars hidden in the closet and under the bed weren't meat but there were body parts, and thousands of photographs of those body parts, and the victims being dismembered with the missing girls. It was because the apartment was so small, they figured that the father and the brother must have been in on it as well, and they arrested them both. But when they played the videotapes, they were shocked that it was the cab driver alone. He had a multiple camera set up and filmed himself cutting them up, 
murdering them, and then having sex with their corpses. With one clip showing him smiling into the camera as he takes the virginity off of a 17-year-old corpse. As the details of the crime started to unfold, the city was horrified. A crime that was too unfathomable to even imagine. And when the cops tried to implicate his father and brother, he admitted to everything. It would take the cops exactly a month to catalog all the pornography and pictures and videos and examine the jars and their contents from the apartment. And the cops were astonished that one man could achieve what the cab driver had done. Yeah, he was one sick fuck, all right. And when police interviewed him, he said that he wanted to make sure that every picture was released so the world could see his trophies and his artwork. The homicide detectives recorded that he was a psychopath and devoid of any human emotion. And he told the cops that he killed the women because they were sluts, and he felt no remorse. And the only one that he regretted killing was a 17-year-old virgin. But he soon got over that and killed her and fucked her when she was dead. It was in an obvious attempt to avoid the executioner's rope that he told investigators that he would show them where the other girls' bodies were, bringing them to several locations in the hills where they would eventually find two of the girls lying in a fetal position wrapped up in rice bags, missing their sexual organs, looking like goddamn religious icons. Lamb admitted that each day after the murders, he spent the day with the bodies, carving out their pussies and the breasts. With the pathologist saying it wasn't an easy task with the tools he had, and it would have taken great strength and fortitude. But I guess where there's a will, there is a way. There are several truths. Your truth, my truth, and the truth. Seven men were picked for the jury because it was considered that the more than 1,000 pieces of evidence to be presented in the case were too gruesome for women. And the case, well, it became a goddamn freak show, with every zip ahead in Hong Kong showing up for it, with half of them intrigued and the other half wanting blood, but all of them wanting a front row seat, while the family members, they wanted payback with the prosecutors accusing Lamb of killing four young women and chopping them up. And they were planning to use his hobby as proof against him to send him back to his maker. Over 1,900 photos, 700 negatives, 1,500 color slides, and a shitload of videos, all a record of his debauchery. Once in front of the judge, he admitted to manslaughter, but not murder, claiming that he was a messenger of God, killing the whores on God's instruction. And he told the world that he was now to be known as the rainy night killer, as it was the rains that triggered these urges. Being clearly unbalanced, he was giving the defense a lot to work with. Australian psychiatrist David Barnes testified that he's convinced that Lam is suffering from serious psychosis, a mental disease that can lay dormant for many years until it's jerked into activity by a possibly trivial incident. But the prosecution ripped apart the cab driver's defense because it was clear that the murders weren't random and they were well planned and well executed. And they figured the fact that he used lights in a tripod was proof of that. And while we're on the subject of executing, <laughs> The seven-man jury began their deliberation at about 11.30 a.m. and shortly after 3 p.m., they returned with a unanimous verdict of murder on all four counts. In a hardly audible voice, Judge Baber then sentenced Lam Gua Wan to death. But Hong Kong's joy was to be short-lived. Because of current laws, the death penalty was overturned to life in jail. And Lam, the dirty Chinaman, whose hobby was to cut out women's breasts and their pussies and keep them in jars, was given a cozy life behind bars.
Legion Forever! The book says no more.